All right, welcome in. Week one of the college football season is upon us. We've got five games coming up in the next couple of days. We want to break down for you here on the College Football Kickoff Show, powered by wagertalk.com. In the house, Ralph Michaels, who is going to step up first here. The pen. Again, I don't have any glasses for you, Ralph, but what I do have is a game that a lot of people are interested in tonight. Colorado taking on North Dakota State. Year two with Dion Ralph. What are we doing with uh, North Dakota State and Dion Sanders in Colorado tonight? Isn't it refreshing, guys, to be talking about an FCS game? I don't think we've ever done that on college football. But, you know, you take a look at the Wager Talk live odds page. The shortcut is wt.buzz backslash odds. You'll see there are 19 FBS versus FCS games today. There's 38 on Saturday. And all 19 games tonight have sides and totals from every casino but one. So these are actionable, live, bettable situations. You know, color me foolish, but you have one of the best teams in the FCS in North Dakota State. They are uh, preseason number two. South Dakota State is clearly the favorite this year. But we know the pedigree North Dakota State has. They've gone on the road numerous times. They know how to beat an FBS foe. And I look at this game, while I lean North Dakota State, my official best bet for the show is going to be over 59 and a half. We don't know what to expect from Colorado on defense with all the new transfers they brought in. We do know that his son is going to have a very fast tempo offense. He's not afraid to throw the ball, and he's not afraid to run up the score. Colorado last year was a favorite of 13 and a half in one game and 23 points in the other. Guess what? They covered those two games, the total going over the total by 15 points and 23 and a half points. North Dakota State is a talented, talented offensive team. They have a quarterback who is number three all time in career passing attempts. Number four, all time in passing yards in Cam Miller. We have a three year starter. We have an experienced O line. We have a dynamic offense that knows how to score points. Again, who really knows what to make of Colorado except this? They will play fast. I think there's value in this 59 and a half. As I was going through my totals this week, I made it 64. It was not enough to get to the window, but it was very close. Give me the over. Colorado, North Dakota State matchup. All right, looking at going up and over. Shocker, no defense in uh, Colorado. I don't think that's going to uh, surprise just about anybody uh, right now. But maybe, just maybe, Rob Vino in the house here, ready to go. feel like it's been a hot minute, Rob Vino, since we have uh, seen one another. And you are going to head to Morgan. What better place than Morgantown this time of year here as West Virginia getting ready to take on Penn State. I can't think of two coaches I trust less than these two, Rob. Uh, so what do you think we're going to get? Because a lot of money coming in on Penn State here all week long, or rather West Virginia all week long. Yeah, I'll tell you, Joe, I'll give you some numbers that were provided to me by our very own Ralph Michaels earlier today that, you know, maybe we would trust James Franklin a little more than we'd like to. But let's start here. West Virginia, this is a noontime start. It's not a night game in Morgantown, but it is a noontime and it is a season opener. So you can just imagine what that venue is going to be like. And this team is in a home underdog revenge mode. Last year, opening day, 23 point underdogs to this, or excuse me, 20 point underdogs to this team. And they get beat by 23, 38 to 15. Penn State blew a couple makeable field goals in that game, but here's the key to that one, and we all remember it. West Virginia scores to make it 38 to, uh, excuse me, 31 to 15 and sneak under the number with three and a half left. Penn State gets the ball on their final drive. They get a first and goal situation with less than 45 seconds left, and they don't kneel on it. They ran two plays. They scored the touchdown to get the cover, which drew the ire a little bit of West Virginia, but certainly made Penn State alumni very, very happy. West Virginia was even in that game in rushing yards, 146 all, but they were minus 170 in the passing game. Garrett Green 
really hadn't become Garrett Green at quarterback at that point in time. There were no turnovers in the game, so Green played pretty clean offensive football. But you go back and look at the stat lines, Penn State pretty much dominated. West Virginia defensively hung in as long as they could. And then, of course, lose 38 to 15. Penn State gets the cover. Penn State's loaded again on both sides of the football. But if you want to nitpick, they do have four new offensive line starters, including the left tackle and the center, which may be the two most important positions on the offensive line. The entire group has some experience, but West Virginia's front seven is arguably the strength of that defense. So the matchup there in the trenches could be even a little better for West Virginia than it was last year. And West Virginia's way further along offensively this year than they were last. I mentioned Garrett Green. He absolutely grew by leaps and bounds as the season went on. 79% of that offensive production is back for West Virginia. They figure better to be better suited offensively this year to face Penn State than they were last. I think, you know, the final look when you take out everything into account here, Joe, you got to like the motivational spot for West Virginia. Um, obviously, I discussed it earlier. It's a revenge. It's a great venue. So we expect them to come to play all jacked up. But while the situationals might favor West Virginia, I'm going to point out these numbers again that Ralph gave me. Penn State head coach James Franklin as a favorite of up to minus 24, 18, 2, and 1, 90% cover rate, <laughs> up to minus 24 as a favorite. If you go all the way back to when he coached lowly Vanderbilt as a favorite of seven or more, he's 54 and 27, 66.7% covers, two out of every three. Money's coming on West Virginia, but those technical numbers, and I'm not a technical handicapper, they're tough to buck. I think the Mountaineers come out early, so I think I'd rather shorten this game up. I like their motivationals. I like their increased experience and talent. I think it's a get in and get out special, Joe. We use that term on the NBA show an awful lot, but I'd get in and get out here with West Virginia first half as plus five and a half, thinking that maybe Penn State, like last year, can wear them out in the second half. But um, I'm going to try West Virginia, small play here. First half plus five and a half. All right, there you go. First half plus five and a half for Rob Vino there. I think it should be an interesting one. We'll learn a little something about both those teams at this point there, Vino. Drew Martin, Drew Martin bets in the house, ready to roll. You're going to head to tomorrow night. Another interesting matchup here with uh, the new ACC member. I can't even say it. It's so funny. Uh, Stanford uh, in the house taking on TCU. I'm a little shocked with this uh, with this spread here. Drew, how about you? What are you looking at in this one? Oh, I think he's muted a little busy. There you go. Oh, wait a minute. Nope. Was he muted? He's still, nope, still not saying nothing. He's, I can mime it out, Drew, because I have a feeling I know what you're going to say here, uh, very much so here. But uh, yeah, we'll get Drew back on here uh, with TCU taking on Stanford tomorrow. It does feel a little strange saying it, though, doesn't it? Where uh, Stanford hanging out in the ACC now, but uh, it is what it is. It's a different college football era here, and I think we got uh, Drew back. Drew, you got, you got us? Have you recovered from Stanford and the ACC here? I can hear you, Joe. Perfect. There we go. We got him. All right, Drew's in the house. Uh, there we go. Much better. Go ahead, Drew. Tell us what you're thinking about this game. All right. How about it, guys? Friday night, 10.30 p.m. Eastern time. A little uh, nightcap before the strong Saturday slate on the farm here. It's Stanford at home. Like, my initial feel is, like, you know, Stanford's going to be very improved here, Joe. It's year two under Troy Taylor, 18 returning starters. Um, the only problem is, you know, kind of projecting in week one with some of these teams that are, quote, unquote, supposed to be a lot improved is, is it really going to happen? This is a team that was three and nine last year, 0 oh and seven at home. We know that Stanford doesn't have a great, you know, home field advantage by any means. And in this type of profile, if you're going to go on the road for a fairly tough trip here, you know, from the state of Texas to California, you want to be doing it week one. I think that's kind of a plus towards TCU. Stanford was only two and five ATS at home last year. And they're up against the TCU team that, yes, down last year, just five and seven, missing a bowl after that national championship game appearance the year before. 
I just like this offense. I really do, Joe. I mean, Sonny, Sonny Dykes at the helm. They got Kendall Bryles as the OC. They just brought in Dana Holgerson as well to c- help out as an assistant. I feel that uh, nine and a half, you know, it, it could lo- look a little bit tall, but this TCU offense is going to look to push it. We've seen it in the past. So if they get Stanford down, you know, this could be one of those where it get, kind of gets out of hand. But again, it comes back to week one. If Stanford's very improved and can get get pressure on the quarterback, it's going to be tough. But if you're needing something Friday night, I would lean you towards the Horned Frogs here and lay, uh, I think they win by doubles, Joe. Uh, You're expecting by doubles. I love that. Well, it's got Blowout City written uh, all over it. So uh, there you go. We've got uh, a little something for everyone into week one of college football. Quick reminder here, guys. These guys are going to break down, of course, a couple of the biggest bets that are coming up and the biggest games, quite honestly, in week one when Clemson and Georgia get together. And, of course, the U, Miami, taking on University of Florida, and they're going to break down this game. We're going to get thoughts from all three of these guys on that. I do want to remind you also, if you have not had a chance to head over to wagertalk.com and visit Ralph Michaels, uh, Drew Martin, or Rob Vino, Uh, Great opportunity to buy two, get one free opportunity is in play right now. Get all access, two weeks, get a third week uh, for free. Take advantage of that. You got NFL just right around the corner. These guys are three of the best in college football that we have at wagertalk.com. So make sure you visit their page and grab an all access package and get every sport Uh, every play that they have for the next three weeks for the price of two. Can't go wrong with that one. As we welcome back in the pen, Ralph Michaels ready to roll here uh, today. And Ralph, all right, let's start with Clemson, Georgia. Really ballsy of Dabo to go ahead and uh, plan this one out a couple of years ago and figure, you know what, let's start the season at the Mercedes-Benz Dome and take on Kirby Smart in Georgia and let's see where we're going to be Interesting test for both these teams, but the market says they're a two-touchdown dog. Do you agree with it? Well, you know, I think the last time Georgia didn't play at least one game in the Atlanta uh, Atlanta Dome, I had hair back then. I think for eight straight years they played in the, in the Georgia Dome. So, you know, very comfortable. I give them a point-and-a-half home edge. I did go and look how AP number one teams do in their season opener. They're actually 10 and four against the spread the last 14 seasons. But two of those ATS losses were at a 42 and a 52 point favorite. So let's turn it around. When I looked at how a ranked team does as a dog of seven or more since 2008 in game number one, like Clemson, well, they're only four and 12 straight up and seven and nine against the spread, including only four and eight against the spread since 2012. So sometimes you think, oh, I don't want to be cute, or it's Joe Public to bet the AP number one, but they've shown they've done a nice job. Now, I am not a Dabo Sweeney fan, and I've gone on a few rants. I think he's doing a criminal injustice to his players, to his coaches, to the alumni and to the fan base, not spending any NIL money. He has brought in one NIL transfer in four years. He just says, I don't wanna do it. I wanna build from within. So while all these other teams are building these super teams year in and year out, Clemson keeps dropping further back. So while I am not a Dabble fan, while I'm not a Clemson fan, in this situation, I think Clemson comes in underrated with the season they had last year. I actually think there is a little bit value with the Tigers. I'm not going to get there, but I'm not a big college prop guy, but I've started putting it more in the repertoire. I look at Carson Beck over one and a half passing touchdowns at minus 155. I think there's great value in the game where he has to play and he's going to play three plus quarters because it's likely to be a competitive game. He's going to get the opportunity to score. Best value, best bet for the show. Carson Beck over one and a half passing touchdowns minus a buck fifty-five. I can't go wrong with that. I know a lot of guys that have uh, Beck in the Heisman uh, future market too as well. Shout out uh, to uh, our friends over on TikTok as well as Instagram, hanging out talking some college football here today. 
I believe at NFL Bet is all about Georgia smacking the living crap out of Dabo Sweeney, Rob Vino. Uh, don't know if you're on that page here, but there seems to be, this is, what a great way to kick off the season, right? But careful, I guess, what you wish for with these two coaches, no? Yeah, I think so. I mean, Dabo's got a point to prove here, obviously. Um, you know, I don't want to say he's on thin ice because he's probably not, but certainly the boosters, the fan base, the media down there, not happy with the results posted by Clemson, certainly last year. So they, they need some improvement here. Um, and maybe they get it, Joe. I mean, for Georgia, let's just take a look at personnel here real quick. We all know Georgia's loaded, and they basically are at the point now where Kirby Smart just reloads every single year. But they did lose their second-best wide, rece wide receiver, projected starter, Ra Ra Thomas, got thrown off the team this past summer. And they're probably going to be without their top two running backs. Let's see how lenient the Georgia Athletic Department is. But their second leading rusher or number two running back um, on the depth chart, Roderick Robinson. He's out. He had surgery, so he's out for at least a couple of weeks. But the number one back, Florida transfer, Trevor Etienne, he's probably out due to a suspension. Now, here's the key. The University of Georgia, he got cleared of charges. They, they made some kind of deal. But the University of Georgia Athletic Department has a mandate that 10% of the schedule must be missed by any player that is found guilty of DUI. ATN found guilty of DUI. So by you know definition, according to the athletic department, he should sit. But it's still up in the air, Joe, and we're talking here on Thursday. So who knows where they're going to land on this decision. I would imagine they probably follow the rules and he doesn't play, which means the ground game gets anchored by three, number three and number four backs, Cash Jones. Branson Robinson, but the OL is still among the best in the country. Some would argue it is the best in the country, and they do have Carson Beck, as Ralph mentioned, and a bunch of talented wide receivers and tight ends. I think the biggest question for me when you look at Clemson, quarterback Cade Klubnick and their offensive line against Georgia's defensive front, can they open up any holes to run the football against this team? Clemson does have a veteran OL back. Can they protect this kid? Because last year he did not look good in a lot of situations. Um, he probably needs a running game to help with that protection. If they can run it and stay in good down and distance situations, Clemson could be in good shape here. But if they can't protect them and they can't run it, it's going to be lights out for the Clemson offense. I think this Atlanta venue, because it's, it's semi-close, right? I think Clemson, South Carolina, you fly into Atlanta to drive to Clemson. Um, it's about 45 mile difference. So Clemson fans will show up here. And Georgia, for what it's worth, guys, only four, seven, and one against the spread as a double digit favorite last year. Looking at my own power ratings, I made Georgia 14 here on the neutral. So the number seems to be fair to me. Clemson's good enough defensively to stay in this game. I think if you bet them, you need a little bit of hope here. You need to have Klubnik not make any costly turnovers. And on the other side of that coin, you need to have Clemson make, you know, at least have one maybe um, really key takeaway that helps to a score, a big special teams play that helps them score, a big offensive vertical pass that helps them score. I don't know that they'll need a bunch to cover 13 and a half, but they're going to need something. That's the risk you take here with Clemson. But I think it's probably worth a small play on Clemson plus 13 and a half. All right, taking the points, right? When in doubt, how about it, uh, Drew? Uh, Dabo scares me, man. Uh, I, You know, I, I think if he loses this game and loses it big, whoo, going to be a very interesting season for Dabo Sweeney. But uh, if he's competitive, stays within a number, and even wins outright, uh, given what we saw from Florida State, maybe this is Clemson's opportunity to come out and – set the world on fire this year. Do you buy Dabo and Clemson? Yeah, Joe, I, I, I'm kind of picking up what you're laying down. I, I, I wouldn't write them off. You know, if mm. they can win the ACC, they find themselves in the playoff. I thought that, um, you know, Ralph brought up a great point in terms of not using the NIL. And then uh, Robbie saying, you know, is Dabo maybe not thin ice? I actually would say he might be. You know, mm. uh, this is college football. Things change quickly. And if he doesn't have a, a, a solid season, he could be on the hot seat. So... That's kind of an interesting dynamic in itself. I'll add on the fact that for this matchup, Clemson 
two of their second starting secondary uh, guys, they might be out as well. So that could kind of hurt them on the back end going up against a Georgia team, very talented all over the all over the field, you know, arguably the most talented football team outside of the NFL here. And it's a fast track, you know, weather's not going to be an issue there in Mercedes-Benz Stadium. I thought both uh, Ralph and Rob brought up good points in terms of just proximity to both of these uh, campuses. I've lived in Atlanta for eight years. Um, it, it, Athens is almost like a suburb of Atlanta, so it could work as a home game. But Clemson's right there. They're both going to travel well. I don't know that I would put too much into uh, home field advantage other than it's a fast track, you know, controlled climate. I would more look at this. I think Georgia has more talent, Joe. So then it would come down to, you know, two touchdowns, 13 in the hook. Do you really want to lay it? I lean towards that side. I really do. I just think uh, top to bottom of the roster, it might be one of those games where it plays out competitive and then third, you know, start of the fourth quarter, Georgia starts to pull away. But if Clemson can turn them over a couple times, stay in it, this could be a surprising one. I think we learn a lot about both teams here, but in terms of uh, kind of risking Risking money week one, this isn't going to check the box for one I'm going crazy with. But um, also, how about that breakdown by Rob Vino in terms of, uh, you know, the legal system there in Athens, Georgia? For some reason, they're always having issues. It is a fun town, I'll tell you that from personal experience. I'll tell you what. Uh, well, you know, you too can have fun when the entire sheriff's department's on the payroll. Did I say that out loud? I think I did uh, say that out loud. It's amazing what you can get away with there. Uh, all right, guys. So there we go. Georgia and Clemson. Uh, one of the big games, uh, obviously, coming up in week one uh, for those ACC homers like uh, Drew and myself. You're a little partial to this next team here uh, as the U is getting ready to start their season. And nothing breaks me out in hives more than thinking about betting on Mario Cristobal. Uh, in a game in which he's a favorite in the swamp on the damn road. Uh, I'm, I'm telling you, Ralph, I'm getting nauseous just thinking about it because uh, I really want to bet the U, but I know how terrible. Uh, the only saving grace in this is that Napier, <laughs> he's only expected to win four games this year. So if, uh, if the U could get lucky, I guess maybe this would be the year they could go on the road and win a game in North Florida. Uh, are you buying Cristobal in Miami over Florida? Well, Joe, one thing you have to remember is this. Florida's only picked to win four games because they have the toughest schedule by far. It is insane how much tougher their schedule is than a couple notches down. So, you know, while you can't say Florida's going to suck because they're playing because their win total's four, you have to say Florida's win total is four because of the schedule they play. You know, last year, Miami of Florida only played the number 59 schedule. So they were not even tested. And yeah, you know, I am semi buying into the Kool-Aid that this is finally the year and Cristobal's third year here. And Charlie, I mean, Charlie Ward. I mean, well, I say Ward and I think back to Florida State and Charlie Ward. So, you know, Ward comes over from Incarnate Word in Washington State. And yes, he's the most dynamic quarterback, but there's still a lot. I mean, when you look at a run and shoot offense that Ward has and what he had at Washington State, they're throwing the ball 75% of the time. They have receivers that are accustomed to that. I'm not sure Miami is so accustomed to that. And oh, by the way, Joe, you know I had to go to the database. Let's quantify what you said about Cristobal. Let's see. He's been here at Miami for two years. He's 8-17 and 17 against the spread. And he's been a favorite up to minus 10 six times. He's lost two of those games outright. And he's 0-6 ATS. There is no way I'm backing Miami. I am with you 100%, Joe. Home opener for Florida. Nobody's giving them a chance, but they still are a talented team. They just had a defense that completely fell apart after six games. And, you know, let's use a very cliche-ish on defense. Uh, teams went through Florida's defense like knife through butter last year. But <laughs> that, that side, I think, is going to help get picked up. Miami having to learn a new offense with that quarterback, I think they're going to struggle a little bit early. This is one where I will take Florida for this is just a light opinion. I'm not getting to the window on it, but with Miami's new offense and the new quarterback, I'm going to give them um, 
I'm going to call them to struggle a little bit early. I will back the Gators first half in this one on the money line. Yeah, I, I mean, I can tell you the chat rooms right now are all over that. Uh, King Cheese, too, is like, mark my words, Florida's going to win it. Time running out with a field goal just to put the dagger in uh, the hopes and dreams of all the U fans here. But Rob Vino, uh, how about it? You think Billy Napier's got uh, anything up his uh, sleeve here? Can uh, Do you think he can pull out the outright upset here as a home dog, or is this just uh, the beginning of the end for the University of Florida and Billy Napier this year? All right. Well, I don't know what the timestamp is on how long this show has run so far, but it's run this far without me using the word over. So we better (laughs) stop it right here, Joe. And I think this game, I don't understand the downward trajectory, even though only a point, but why bid it down from 55 to 54? To me, it makes no sense. Um, both teams are fully stocked skill position-wise. Graham Mertz, he was what he was at Wisconsin. But last year in Florida um, with Billy Napier as his head coach, I mean, 73% completions and a 20 to 3 touchdown to interception ratio. And the entire skill position unit back this year, that's pretty good numbers right there. And Miami's well-stocked as well, Joe. I'm surprised you don't have your Xavier Restrepo jersey on <laughs> because he's the number one draft pick at wide receiver, right? And I'll talk about Cam Ward for a minute here. And Ralph's absolutely right. Incarnate Word, Air Raid, go to Washington State, have your uh, head coach or OC, excuse me, follow you to Washington State, remain Air Raid. Oh, all right. I think we... I, you know what? Because he wants my Restrepo uh, jersey. I think that's why there, Vino. All right. I was going to give it to you, but go ahead. You're back. Go ahead. Talk to me. Uh, pick it up. I know. Guy wants the Restrepo jersey. I'll give it to him. Go ahead, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> He's one of the best in that conference, right? Um, and I, I will, I'll go back real quick and just talk about Shannon Dawson, the OC. At my Got a ton of experience running air raid with West Virginia. He both under Dane Holgerson. Um, this offense is going to be tailored a little bit. Tell you, man, he's stuck on Restrepo, man. I don't Tempo know what it is. In this offense this year, I think we froze again. No, you got uh, Yeah, we got you, oh, Robbie. Okay. Go ahead. You got it. Okay. <laughs> I thought I froze again. But he said there's going to be a little more up-tempo in this offense to suit Cam Ward. So I think you give Cam Ward the weaponry. You give Cam Ward um, the OC who's familiar with the air rate, and it'll be just fine. There is a question about offense's first week, right? We saw it last week. SMU is supposed to be this powerhouse offense. It didn't work out for Preston Stone and company. Mm. Hawaii is supposed to throw points up all over Delaware State. It didn't really work out for Timmy Chang in Hawaii. So there's some fear of stumbling out of the blocks. But last year, Florida averaged 28 points a game. Miami averaged 31 points a game. It's a big game for both. I think the offenses are better than the defenses personnel-wise. And with um, Miami pushing pace a little bit, I think this game gets over, Joe. To me, 54 is a little light. I could see something in the 30-27 range here that would fit to our chat, which thinks that Florida will win by a field goal at the end. So maybe it's Florida 30-27. But I'm going to play it that way, up and over 54. Up and over uh, 54. I knew Vino would have an over in him uh, when it was all said and done somewhere here, Drew. Uh, But listen, Drew, you know as well as I do, the only thing more fun than delusional University of Miami fans, the U's back, baby, uh, is absolute delusional University of Florida Gator fans. They might be even more delusional than Miami fans here. But something's got to give. You got to love the talent. At Miami, it's the coaching, my issue. How are you approaching this game? Sure, Joe. Yeah, I love your point. I mean, being a, living in Florida, you, you learn a couple things about college football fan bases, and one of them is you have mixed emotions. You almost kind of root for some of them, but it, it, at some point you bring up Florida fans, you bring up Miami fans. It almost brings a smile to your face when they're not, you know, all that great at teams because it kind of – dampens uh, uh, the fan bases and, and what they can really say. But overall, guys, breaking this game down, oh, man, talking about the Miami Hurricanes, being in South Florida for more than half a month, it's just 
every single year. Oh, the U is back. The U is back. And we're getting that again and this year. Hey, will it work out? This is a great one to start off. 3.30 on ABC in the swamp. I can't wait for this one. I'm actually talking about a mile away from the swamp right now in Gainesville, Florida. I would break it down this way, Joe. Florida is was one of the youngest. I mean, if you go by the amount of freshmen they played, they were the single youngest team in all of college football. So coming back after that and adding a top 10 portal class in, I think Florida is going to be one of the more improved teams in the country. I really do. Not to mention they they returned their starting quarterback, Graham Mertz, who just broke the school's completion percentage record over 72% last year, a 20 to three touchdown to interception ratio in the same system. He should be improved. Now, Ward coming to Miami, I think that that is a, a great setup for the Hurricanes as well. I'm kind of buying into it. But to Rob's point, you know, who would be betting the, un the under, the one angle I'll bring up is new quarterback, new system, week one, on the road, hostile environment. It doesn't always work out well. You know, it would almost be better if they were playing this game for Miami a little bit later. I think it actually helps the Gators side of things. And then coaching. You brought up Cristobal, Joe. I mean, in terms of game management, he, he's all recruiting. In terms of game management, I, you, you can make the argument he's the worst coach. I mean, that Georgia Tech game last year, how bad was that? We can't forget. Oh. And he's up against Billy Napier, who his tenure in Florida hasn't been great, obviously. But we can't forget. He's a two-time all-sunbelt coach, head coach of the year. This guy can coach. Um, I think it, it sets up even better for the Florida Gators in their season win total, which you guys touched on a little bit. You could get over five at plus money right now. They got seven home games. Mm. Um, it's obviously a tough schedule. SEC schedule, for some reason, they're scheduling Miami and UCF in there, and they have to play Florida State. So it, it, no doubt about it, the schedule's no joke. But they got seven home games, two winnable trips to Starkville and Tallahassee. I actually like the Florida Gators season win total over and you, we get it at plus money, and it correlates here with uh, – I do like the Gators uh, against the Hurricanes. No, no, so no doubt that the Swamp is an impossible place to play in, uh, and crazy things usually happen in the Swamp. And crazy things happen when Mario Cristobal calls plays too, but that's neither here nor there. I kind of tend to agree with you. I do think that number is a little low on Florida's win total over the season, but there is uh, no doubt week one – should be a absolute uh, rip here. Guess starting tonight, we got tonight, we got Friday, we got Saturday, we got Sunday. We also have the ability for you guys to partner up with Ralph Michaels, with Rob Vino, with Drew, uh, and anybody over at wagertalk.com. It's fairly simple. Buy two weeks of all access. Get a third free. Doesn't get any better than that. That's three weeks to kick off the college football season as well as the NFL season. In fact, all access means... All sports, all plays, everything that these guys play, including Major League Baseball as we get ready for the postseason. And nobody knows it better than these guys here. So the opportunity to partner and right off the bat, build that bankroll this football season, buy two weeks of all access, get a third free. That is the way to do it. All right, don't forget, hit that uh, thumbs up, follow us, uh, shout out. To those of you guys, uh, Momo, Tommy, and company over on TikTok, appreciate you guys. Welcome into the Wager Talk family. Grind at all times on Instagram, hanging with us. Uh, those of you joining us on X as well, we certainly do appreciate it. Uh, we'll be back again tomorrow. We got another five big games that we're going to break down for you here on the college football tip off show. But the best news is if it's individual game breakdowns you're looking for, uh, nobody has more of those than we do here at Wager Talk TV. In fact, just go ahead and click on that video on your screen right now and check out all the standalone single game videos, breaking everything down with all the best bets that you need to know right there on the screen. Best of luck with the plays. We'll see you again soon here on the